So glad to have you all here. Wow. This is exciting. So many familiar faces and new faces too. Um, my name is Lori Hamill. I'm super excited to moderate this panel. Thank you so much, uh, Melissa, for putting this together and for the SAG Foundation because um, this has just been an incredible how-to. These eight sessions and this being our final one has just been so exciting. So hello to everybody at home and anybody that's watching it. Um, I hope that you will be able to really sink into this topic of release and promotion of your short film. So let's get started. All right, first of all, um, if everyone could please introduce themselves here on the panel and just tell us a little bit about yourself. Would you like to start, Megan? Um, my name is Megan Costello. I'm a programmer for the Hamptons International Film Festival. It's my fourth year with this particular festival. And in addition to programming for the fest, I also help manage our annual screenwriters lab and help uh, with the curation of some of our year-round programs. Wonderful. Pulkin? Hi, uh, my name is Pulkit Dutta. I am a writer, director, producer, in no particular order. Um, I've worked on shorts, documentaries, features, all kinds of projects. Um, I'm also uh, a co-founder of this um, organization called Kalakars, which is um, about empowering South Asian artists in American film and television. Timothy? Hey, I'm Timothy Cooper. Um, I am a writer and director uh, and a script consultant. And I can go into my background more, but uh, or we can get into that later. But um, most recently, I had a short film um, at uh, the 2017 Tribeca Film Festival called Lemon. And uh, as we'll probably discuss, that film uh, is now on United Airlines and Amazon Prime. And, and I'm going to Manchester, England on Wednesday for the Manchester International Film Festival, where it's in competition. Um, uh, and I do lots of other things too. Including teaching. Yes. Um, yeah, I also teach, uh, teach screenwriting privately with uh, my company, Blueprint Screenwriting Group. And, and I consult on lots of scripts. And that means um, reacting and giving feedback to, uh, to feature scripts as well as commercial short films, web series, and uh, doing one-on-one -on -one feedback, whether written or uh, you know, in person. Um, to help uh, people's and more often companies' uh, scripts get to a place where they are ready to film. That's wonderful. I just feel like having this, um, so many different angles that you're all covering with this topic is so helpful to us because um, I think that this can sometimes be uh, something that we just don't even think about at all when we're first starting and people say, make your own short film. And then this is at the end of it, it's like, wait a second, what do I do now? So this is um, just going to be so juicy and full of great information. I, I'm so excited. But first of all, just to kind of get uh, into the inspiration, um, what made you decide, when did you decide that you wanted to be a part of the film world? Like what, what's that spark there, Megan? Um, I actually didn't go to film school. I'm not a filmmaker myself. Uh, I've always been very interested in film, borderline obsessive. And uh, I kind of noticed once I started as a hobby, you know, tracking which films went to which festivals and who was buying what, that I should probably try to find a way to get paid to do this. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I just count myself as a fan, like a professional fan who wants work to be seen by everybody. So. And we love you for it, truly. Was there one film that sort of sparked things for you, like when you were a kid or later on? <sighs> I've been asked this, uh, but it's so hard. Just, I always say my favorite film is Harold and Maude. I'm not sure if that's true, but it definitely is a favorite film. Interesting. Pulkin? Um, my, I think my journey to film started through writing um, when I was uh, a kid. Um, I used to write a lot of short stories and Poetry, which hopefully no, no one will ever see. Um, and I don't remember when exactly it was, but I think at some point I decided, I, well, I was watching movies and I sort of started wondering how I would make it or how I would change a scene or how I would do it differently. Um, I don't remember what movie that was, but it was through a series of movies. And uh, in terms of studying film, I actually studied film, um, well, the academic side of film, so film studies uh, or cinema studies. Um, 
because I was also very interested in how films are interpreted by people, which I think is also an equally important part of making films, is knowing how they will be seen. Um, and yeah, and then I started uh, working in film production companies and assisting filmmakers and fell into producing by accident and then started loving that and yeah. Wonderful, thank you. Timothy? Um, I used to write short stories like Polkit as well and, and then um, I do remember I was in a play my freshman year in college um, as an actor, not a very good one, um, but uh, I was in a play and, I, and it was written by another student and for some reason it only occurred to me then that someone had to write the play uh, that, that we're all in. And I was like, oh, wait. Oh, well, if, if she can do it, maybe, maybe I could do it as well. And then um, eventually, after writing a lot of plays, many of which were very mediocre, um, and doing you know improv for like three people in a bar basement, which I still do, um, I realized that film you know, could be a way to do this on a grander scale and subject more people to my point of view. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, as, as actors, so often we are looking at the film business from a certain viewpoint, one of being the actor. We get the script, it's already done. Uh, we're going into production, other people are doing that. And then when it goes to the time of distribution, that's somebody too, somebody else as well that's taking care of that. So it's like turning the whole thing around and looking at it from another point of view. So how do you even organize yourself into knowing what you need to do once you're done with your film? How, when does that need to start, this process of being able to put this out into the world? When do you need to be thinking about that? You're looking at me, okay, I'll start. <laughs> <laughs> All right then. Um, I'd made the mistake before of uh, only thinking about what to do with the film once I'd made it, mm -hmm. and I realized that was a really bad idea. Um, because by then you've also lost out on a lot of opportunity and a lot of um, things you could have worked on while you were making the film. Um, so now what I do is, uh, script writing is obviously key, it's, it's foundational to the film, so once the script is ready and I'm starting to go into pre-production is when I start thinking what to do with the film when it's done. Um, and, the re and there's multiple reasons for that. There's, you know, when you're planning um, a shoot, uh, you have to also now, nowadays, especially with social media and everything, you have to think about what materials can we create while we're shooting. Um, so not just for your press kit, but just, you know, you just need to take a lot of pictures behind the scenes and uh, of the readings or whatever. So just collecting a lot of media assets. Um, so it's very useful to plan that before you even start shooting. Um, and then also just being very clear about um, I think where you want the film to go, like what your audience is going to be. And every filmmaker and every writer thinks that everyone in the world should watch their film, um, which is valid. Um, but the reality is not everyone will watch your film. And I think the more realistic you are from the beginning of who you think will watch it, the more targeted your approach can be even while you're making it and then when you send it to festivals and all of that. When you talked um, about feeling, um, when, when you first time you realized I should have been doing this earlier, um, you said that there were things that you missed out on. Is there anything else that you feel like now that you've been through the process so many times, besides the things you just mentioned, is there anything else that you think is of value that you might be able to share right now that, um, that you couldn't see before uh, as far as gaining momentum with your film so that when you get to the point you're distributing it, there's more happening for you? I mean, going back to the audience question, actually, that, that the audience building part is, is really important. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, starting all these social media accounts and, and all of that. It, it just means raising the awareness of the film within at least your community to start with, right? Um, start with the people you know and the communities you know and just start there and just start telling them, hey, I'm making my film, this is happening. Even if it's your own personal Facebook account or whatever it is, um, that will spread. Right? People will then talk, they will talk to each other, and that, so that's, that's something I missed out on in my first experience was, I remember like no one knew that I'd even made a film yeah. until it was done, and then I was trying to like catch up and get them to know it. 
um, what's been happening lately, and I, um, I've been touring festivals with my short film, Wishful Whiskers, which is screened at several festivals with Timothy's film, um, is, you know, from the very beginning when, even I think as I was finishing the script, I started sharing it with people and sharing it online, not the script, but the idea online, um, and then pre-production and everything, I kept sharing it everywhere. Um, and it built a sort of community, at least within my friends and family, mm -hmm. and then they told other people about it. So that was tremendously helpful. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, and that's something that we all have now. We all have social media and a way to get started right now, right from where you're at. Thank you. Because I think the other part about this series, too, for me, is like looking at what resources are available that maybe we're not looking at and what resources are free because we might as well be taking advantage of that. And if you've never been through the process before, you don't even know where to look. And that's why having your experience that you're sharing with us helps to be able to see um, advantages that or things that we can take advantage of al along the way that might already be there kind of hiding in plain sight. Timothy? And there are also, just piggybacking on that, there are special interest groups that are definitely interested in your particular topic. And, you know, just the same way that there are festivals, I'm sure Megan can speak to this better, but there are festivals that are targeted to specific interests, you know, there are sci-fi film festivals and horror film festivals and et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's like a, a festivals about uh, skateboard movies and there's festivals about movies about food. And so there's like, they're so targeted. And, but this, for this, in the same manner, there are um, interest groups that whatever your topic is, whether it's like horror aficionados or my friend um, did an amazing film about a uh, documentary about um, someone who's autistic. And so, of course, the, those were the groups she was reaching out to even while the film was in process and still getting made. Um, and so it depends on your particular subject matter. But if you can find those audiences, whether it's Facebook groups, um, local groups, international conferences, and so on, you can definitely um, start to build your audience even from the uh, inception stage, from the script, even from the Kickstarter stage. That's a great way to start building. And Sorry, just picking off of that, um, a good example uh, with my film, Wishful Whiskers, it's, it's basically about a little girl who wants a mustache. It's a kind of weird story. Um, it's great. Thank you. Um, we, did a, we did a whole crowdfunding campaign for it, and, and what uh, Timothy has talked about, we were looking for special interest groups that might be interested in helping us boost the campaign. Um, and because it was all about mustaches and this quirkiness, so we actually ended up finding, like, there's something called the American Mustache Institute. Um, <laughs> look it up, it's a real thing. Um, and they just promote mustache and beard growing around the country. Um, and they have chapters around the country, and they're really lovely people. Um, so I just reached out to them. I'm like, hey, I have this story about this little girl who wants a mustache. It's kind of up your alley. And they're like, fantastic. So they kind of boosted that for me. Um, so you, you, know, you just have to get really creative, too, about these groups out there. I think when, once you find them and they really jump on board what you're doing, it's, it's magic. Oh, that's wonderful. And Megan, for you, as far as like, you're, so you're curating for your audience. So when you see films coming in, um, do you feel like you already know what your audience is going to like? Or do you base it on what your aesthetic is? It's a combination of both, I would say. Um, my feeling with it is, you know, it should be halfway kind of not catering to your audience, but, you know, knowing what they like and um, what they'll respond well to, and then also kind of challenging them as well. Um, you know, this might be a little bit out of their comfort zone, but it's something that we feel is just really important to see, either artistically very bold or just a new point of view. Um, so it's some sort of combination. And I think as a filmmaker, again, just knowing your audience helps so much because when you are applying to film festivals, you know, you could take a look at, you know, other other festival programs really try to watch as much as you can get a sense for what the festival kind of brand is or what their their past programs are because um, that will save you a lot of time and money if you have a really great genre midnight film maybe our festival is not really the right one for you not that you know we sometimes will take those but that's not the bulk of our programming it's better to go to one of more of these niche festivals um, 
And uh, yeah, and now it's easier than ever to kind of get a sense of which festival, you know, kind of trends more towards. Um, you can either, you know, learn for yourself by going to these festivals, but even a lot of festivals now are partnering with Vimeo uh, to kind of curate their own channels. Um, so I know like Sundance has a Vimeo channel of films that they've, you know, short films they've played and Toronto has their own channel and whatnot. So the more research you can do, the the better it is for you to kind of find festivals that are a good fit for you, save you a lot of time and money just in that whole submission process. Yeah, well, we'll probably get to it, but if you're looking at, um, you know, all the film festivals on Film Freeway and so on, um, and without a box, you can see you can see, you know, based on those websites, what they've selected in the past, as Megan's saying. And, you know, I, you know, I was looking at, I have a, you know, comedy, and it's kind of a broad comedy, you might say. And it's like quirky and dark in some ways. And then I was looking at some festivals that I, I was like, oh, I want to go to South Korea or whatever. So I looked at some, a, a certain festival in South Korea, and I was like, oh, they would, they, they have never selected a film like this, so why would they start now? And, you know, for the same way, if a, a festival, as Megan's saying, is like is predominantly drama, then it's like they might select some comedies, but is that going to be your best bet? Um, and same with whatever genre or subject matter you're working in, you have to see, you know, is this, is this what they have been looking for in the past and are going to look for again? Right. And so it's, it's really being strategic from the beginning by defining your audience, you are then almost funneling into what festivals are going to have an audience that's also going to enjoy this. Um, I love that idea because it, it just, there's so many parts, moving parts, things to put together as a new filmmaker that you want to have the path as smooth as possible. How, how do you even start with a budget for this kind of thing to think about what do I need to do after my film is complete? What a topic, right? Uh, well, <laughs> I mean, well, you know, if, you, if you're looking at submitting your film festivals, your, your film to film festivals, it can get really expensive really fast. I'm sure both of you are familiar with this. I mean, it, you know, some of the top tier festivals can easily be 75 or $100 to submit. And it's like a few of those, and now you're, you know, you're equaling your budget of the film itself. So my advice would be to be very targeted in that and say, you know, which festivals am I aiming for and which could I actually attend? Like, which would be a boon to, to me and my career that I would actually go to? And if it's just, I mean, I always tell my, my students, like, you can get into festivals. You could probably get into as many festivals as you want because there are thousands of festivals just in the Northeast alone every year. I mean, there, there are just so many. If you're looking on Without a Box or Film Freeway, there, you, can, you could spend all your money that way if you want to. But the question is, why? What are you actually seeking? You know, if you're seeking just to say, I got into some festivals, well, great. If you have that budget, that's awesome. I don't have that budget. So I'm looking, you know, what festivals can I actually attend? And that will either be great for networking or great for making contacts within the industry or great for finding funding for my feature that I'm now working on of, of my short film. But, you know, aside from that, you have to really think about, you know, why, why am I applying to all these? Because, again, you can get accepted um, just because there are so many festivals that have to fill a slot. So it depends on what sort of tier you're going for and, and why are you aiming for that tier. The way I've started doing it now is um, being, like Timothy said, it, it gets very expensive. So when I'm budgeting, I'm thinking to myself after doing research, okay, these are the, say, three or four top festivals that I think I can get into that have programmed similar films in the past that I don't mind spending money to submit to. Um, and then there's literally thousands and thousands of others that are either cheaper or free or, you know, that you can try. Um, the other thing that was really useful for me was um, going back to community, tapping into all these people that have known about me making the film so far. Mm -hmm. Um, because I'm sure like all of you, you know, we have other filmmaker friends, actor friends who have also been in festivals, tap into that network because every time someone goes to a festival, 
if they've actually physically gone there, um, ideally they've made connections and they've connected with the programming team and you know, um, so those connections also help and Megan can probably speak to that. Um, so that's actually been really useful to me is just, you know, asking other filmmaker friends like, hey, I saw your film, went to this festival last year, it's similar genre to mine, can you help me figure out, you know, all so that sometimes it works, mm -hmm. you know. No, absolutely. Um, both really great advice to filmmakers. I mean, I always tell filmmakers, like, unfortunately, it can get, as you said, like, very expensive to submit to these festivals. So the more targeted you are and knowing what you want, um, it's just important to budget those submission fees out because, unfortunately, you know, our festival is a nonprofit organization. We can't, we're very limited in the kind of fee waivers we can provide to filmmakers and we get, you know, thousands of films submitted and almost as many emails asking <laughs> to do so for free and I wish we could. Um, a word of advice if you do and I think, you know, go for it to, to reach out and, and see if you can try to get a waiver from the programming team. But if you're going to, you have to give us kind of a reason to, like I'll get a lot of emails just being like, hey, I'm broke, can I have a fee waiver? <laughs> um, not telling me anything about your film or about who you are or why we should consider doing this. And, um, and for the most part, unfortunately, it is gonna be a very rare occasion outside of our alums that we can offer that to. But if you give us a very, very compelling reason, like this is a film that I think would be really great for your audience for these reasons, um, then you know, we're, we'll absolutely take that into consideration. Oh, that's good to know too. Had never thought of that. <laughs> Ask for it for free. I mean, you might as well, right? Um, what about when, when you were talking, Pulkit, about having um, connections within the festival? How does that work? Um, being somebody who's work, you know, putting the festival together, how does that work for you? How does that make you feel? Um, I think you should try to meet the programmers. I think that's that's the quickest way for one of us to see your film. Um, again, we, I, I'm going back to this particular festival. We've got thousands of submissions. There are only four of us on the team. Um, so we have a very wonderful committee of volunteers who help us navigate that very large amount of films um, in the few months that we have to, and every single one gets watched. I just wanna make that clear. Um, just so that there isn't any confusion. If we are charging you a submission fee, we will watch your film from start to finish. Um, in the most case, multiple people will see your film. Um, and so on that note, um, I already lost track of the well, question. We're, we're, we're just talking about how, how to meet the programmers. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So if you do attend festivals, you don't, film doesn't even have to be in the festival. You can go to some of these New York-based ones um, that have some industry presence or panels like this and um, get, some, get a way to kind of meet the decision makers. Having a name to the face to the film is the quickest way that myself or one of my colleagues will see it rather than going through that long process of going through our screening committee and then getting reviews back on that and then going through another round and then by the third or fourth round it ends up you know in front of me you kind of bypass that and um, so I absolutely recommend trying to use your connections if you have a friend who knows a friend or a friend who you know is an alum at this festival any way you can kind of cut through all of that I would recommend to you. Has that worked for either of you in the past? Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so um, it's a tried and true idea. Tried and true idea. Yeah. So I mean, so much of this industry, and it's not unique among industries where it's like who it's who you know, but it's not just who you know. You have to have a quality film to back it up. Um, I often compare festival acceptances, tell me if you agree, Megan, to college acceptances. So you could be super qual, you could have the best film or be the best person on earth and not get accepted into the school that you want to accept simply because they have so many factors that they're looking at. You know, what, do they have another film that's also about um, elves that want to, you know, um, fly. I don't know, but uh, that's my next film. But um, um, and if they already have another one, you know, and then yours got seen second or isn't quite doesn't quite have the star power or whatever it is, you might not be accepted. And that doesn't mean your film isn't great or isn't uh, you know as good. 
It's just that they are looking for to fill us, you know. No, absolutely. Um, I wish that wasn't the case. I can't tell you how many films I see a year that I absolutely love and we just do not have room for in our program. We only have, you know, each, most of these short films end up in short blocks. They're about 90 minutes. We really can't exceed that. And um, so a lot of times it comes down to just the runtime, which is a really sad truth, but it is, you know, if, if we have 10 minutes left in a block and your film is, you know, 12 or 15 minutes, sometimes that's just enough to kind of sway it to another direction. Um, and again, it is about, you know, there's so many factors that go in rather than just, is this film good or is this film that we like? Is it, you know, we have to balance out our program. We have to make sure that we're representing all sorts of different storytellers and different perspectives. And, you know, we can't just play five short films all on the same topic from the same you know point of view uh so it's i always try to reassure filmmakers it's not personal it really isn't like i i, I wish i could emphasize this more my least favorite day of the year is sending out those letters um especially because it's to filmmakers that I love but again you know I will remember the ones that I love that didn't necessarily make it and I will follow up with you again the next year um, to see if you have new work and it's worth um, just because you didn't get in one year definitely keep persisting and try to maintain the relationship with us as well and something I've noticed and correct me if I'm wrong but um, programmers also talk to each other in, oh, in different all the festivals, time. Right? Oh, absolutely. Um, which I've found to be really useful because if I've been to one festival where my film is screened, often those programmers will recommend it to another festival and I'll just randomly hear from another festival mm -hmm. saying, hey, we want your film, which is always a pleasant surprise. Um, or, you know, in a couple of cases recently, you know, the programmer at one festival has sent us emails saying, hey, this is another festival that your film would be great at. Send it to them. Here's a discount code, whatever it is. Um, so programmers are friends with each other too, so they're always talking to each other. Absolutely, um, yeah, especially <laughs> films that do end up, you know, in our festival and films that don't, I'm like, hey, um, you know, this, saw this really, really great documentary, like, this would be great for your festival. We couldn't play it, unfortunately, but you should definitely consider it. Um, so it's true, it's a, it's a smaller network than you think. Um, just going back to what Megan was saying about runtime, um, I, I always say, as, if you can tell the story in less time, you know, with the same quality, please do. Um, and in fact, um, there was someone who made an adorable, I want to say it was a one minute short film in, that played with our set in, um, in, uh, in Bloomington, Indiana, um, that played in a festival with, uh, with me, with Polkett and my film. And um, it was, yeah, I think it was like one minute long and guess what? It got into pretty much every festival. Because anyone, because any programmer could be like, that was cute. I could fit that in, yeah. right? Versus like, I have a 30 minute dark drama, uh, you know, that's just like, it might be good, but it might be gut wrenching to watch. And it's like, how, how many festivals can actually fit in a 30 minute drama? It's like, that, that takes up a space that, well, 30 one minute films could go in. Or, you know, or a bunch of five to ten minute films. So you, you, you definitely, in, in many cases, less is more and it means more efficient storytelling. As long as you can still tell your story and develop your characters in a quality way. No, absolutely. It's true. Like, I've been known to sneak in a 40 minute film or two into a program, but there's space for one or two of those tops in the whole program. Because um, I... It, the film has to be so good that I can justify not inviting five other films in its place. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. You know, Megan, you watch so many short films, and we're talking about making short films. Can you, uh, we talked about this a little earlier, can you talk about uh, what you see as qualities uh, in the short films that get your attention, or why they start standing out, and if that changed for you from when you first started watching so many films and then you started seeing a pattern. You want to talk about that? Sure, absolutely. Um, one of the reasons I love short films so much is I think there is so much more room for creativity and diversity in storytelling and storytellers as well. It's just, it, the truth is, it's just cheaper and quicker and faster to make a short film. Um, and 
there's so much room for experimentation. So anything that is just, I feel, really different or artistically bold tends to stand out more than some more conventional storytelling and whatnot. But it's true, like we watch thousands and thousands of films every year um, and it can be a little difficult sometimes not to get burnt out. But again, you know, I count myself as a fan first and I never want to get too settled within my own taste or my own ideas of what I think is good. I think it's important as a curator to, you know, know yourself and have confidence in yourself, but I never want to get too settled and set in my ways and risk maybe missing something that is especially new um, or interesting just because it's not something I've seen before. So I'd say over the years, I just try to check in with myself and, um, and make sure that I remember like why we're doing this. <laughs> And I mean, for me, when I, you know, my job is reading and writing and consulting on scripts and the scripts I remember, and you see this time and time again, when you talk to executives and, and writers, it's like, what, what script do you remember? And the same goes for films is I felt something like it made me feel something. It changed my, the, my point of view about something and made me feel strongly. And that could be laughter and that could be tears and it could be both. It could be fright, whatever it is. Um, and if you, I, I don't know if any of you have had the chance, but if you can see just in, as an example, and I think you might even be able to buy it online, but it's also in theaters, the Oscar nominated short films. Um, and I've only seen the live action ones. There's also the animation ones, animated ones and the documentaries. But if you can see the Oscar nominated live action and there are five of them, and you immediately see why they were nominated. Because if you don't feel something after the first, even the first minute of each of these, I mean, you're a robot. Like they're, they're so striking and they each make you feel something different, uh, but you identify with the characters and you're feeling powerful emotions and you remember it when you leave. And uh, for me, that's, that's key when I see a script, when I see a film. Well, it's really, it feels like it's digging into your choice, like really deciding from a very strong point of view, which we understand as actors, you know, making strong choices, but also making it very personal because you're going to be on a journey with your film. You're going to be starting out uh, in something that you, you're maybe not familiar with, territory of making your own film. So to be able to have something that feels great to you and that you can really stand behind will also help to push that process forward because you also don't want to be in the middle of it and you have to learn something and it's hard. You know, I, I don't understand what I need to do about distribution. Should I do self-distribution or should I try to look for some? I don't know what happens at this point. And to have that fire in your belly to keep going because what you're making is strong enough from your point of view that you want this story to be told. And that will probably touch other people as well. But I love that idea of looking at the Oscar nominated choice. I think connected to what you just yeah. said was also, um, you're gonna have to talk about your film constantly, mm. uh, even after it's made. So you better not get sick of it, basically. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and you know, and, and, and I've seen filmmakers, uh, especially at festivals sometimes. We when can I, tell, yeah. When, yeah, we, yeah, we know. Um, and you know, I mean, I you know, when I meet other filmmakers and they're, I ask them, hey, what's your film about? And they're just like tired of talking about it. And I get it. I get it that you have to keep saying the same log line a thousand times to different people. But if you're you're not feeling the excitement in your gut mm -hmm. um, of like, hey, I just made this really cool film that I'm really happy about, mm -hmm. the other person's gonna feel it. You know, the programmers feel it. Other people feel it. Everyone feels it. Um, and and I think that excitement has to kind of carry you through from like script through like mm -hmm. until the film is you know distributed and everything and I mean that's the cool thing if you're if you're confident in your film which you, you better have been since the since the beginning because you're the main one pushing it when everyone says it's not you know we don't have the money for it or we can't find the actors for it or you know we can't find the location whatever it is you're the one pushing it the whole time but you know you have to be that advocate the whole time and then it's it actually feels better when you're rejected, because you're like, they're wrong. Uh, that festival's wrong. It's just like college. You're like, well, they, they're missing out if you really believe in your film. And that will, that fire, as Polkett says, is what's going to keep you going and just being like, 
okay, they, they didn't want the film for whatever reason. That's fine. I'm just going to keep moving and getting it to that audience. And it won't leave you devastated and questioning yourself if you really have been advocating for it the entire time. Well, I think we're looking at a group of very persistent people, actors. I mean, you know, already being through that kind of process that we've all been through with our work, um, you know, can apply very easily to this other side of it, to being able to create a story and, and push it through. Um, let's talk a little bit about some specifics, things like artwork that you're going to need later. Can you talk about how you found people to help you out with that or what you might be looking at? Maybe even, I don't know, in pre-production, I don't know exactly when that might come up to be handy to start thinking about that. Um, I, so I, for art artwork, um, at least for this last film, I found artists online. Um, so when we were going into pre-production, I wanted just one image, one graphic, just to put it out there for social media, um, like a concept poster. Um, before I'd even cast the film, I just needed mm -hmm. something. Um, and it, because I was sharing it on Facebook a lot about the film, uh, a former professor of mine who I'm friends with on Facebook was like, hey, I have this current student who does really cool graphic design. Ooh. Do you want to talk to her? I'm like, sure. And then we talked and, you know, it was, you know, it's, and it's a student who's really eager to do more work and, you know, you get a great um, collaboration out of that. So she made a fantastic concept poster. Um, and then recently, uh, since I've made the film and everything, I wanted to make like a more final poster. Um, and similar thing, I was, you know, on Instagram, I follow a bunch of artists and, and I found an illustrator on Instagram. I just reached out to her and she loved the film and just, you know, mm. um, so I just, you know, keep exploring other artists, I guess, is the key. Mm -hmm. um, you'll find people that way. But, but it seems to me that most festivals or most people will not be, they don't need the press kit, they don't need the artwork until you're accepted. So, mm -hmm. you know, we focused... For, for my, just this most recent short, we focused the design entirely on the film, you know, the, getting the film to the best place it could possibly be. Then we started thinking about that stuff once we started submitting in anticipation of hopefully getting accepted somewhere. And once you do start getting these festival acceptances, it's so important to pick the right still. Um, oh, no, yeah, it because yeah. everyone judges a book by its cover. I, that's yeah. the truth it is and you know audiences you know when they're flipping through the catalog or the program they're not reading no one's reading anything if, you, if there's a striking image they're going to want to learn more about it so do not you know take your time with picking which deal you think like not only represents your film but will draw more interest because that's how you're gonna get people to see it i actually learned that um sort of the hard way because for, for when we finish our film um, there's a segment in the middle of the film which is sort of dreamlike and it goes into a different zone and it's kind of not a twist but kind of a twist um, so when we were thinking of stills I was very adamant I told my producing partner like hey I just want to use a still from the beginning of the film and not give anything else away and I was like being very precious about it um, and my producing partner he just kept he's like no that's not interesting enough and he went through the middle of the film, found this really interesting still from this moment that I didn't want to give away. And he's like, this is your still. And I fought him on it for so long. Um, but then he was right in the end because once we started sending it to festivals, it ended up being like the, the main header image for some festival websites. And like mm -hmm. it was in there, you know, every, it, they use it everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, he was totally right on that. Yeah. And it becomes kind of your branding for the film too. You know, it's, it's not just at one festival, but... You know, it will as it goes through the circuit. That is going to become the visual emblem for your film. So, definitely take your time in choosing the right one. Well, I'm thinking in similar ways, talking about like going to festivals and meeting programmers, starting to see how things work. And you were saying, Timothy, to watch the Oscar-nominated no film, short films. Maybe a way to do it is to um, and let me know what you guys think about this, but to be able to look at some of your favorite films and look at what their poster was, look at what that image was and how just to kind of start feeling into how did they pick this? Why is this a compelling image? Um, just to sort of teach yourself sort of what you're interested in, what, what 
draws you to certain imagery and then how you might be able to find that within your own film. Is that yeah, a, a you, way to you definitely start training don't yourself? need to make a poster that you yourself would pass up. I mean, even or just look at Netflix. Look at all, look at all the films listed. Um, look at all those posters. They they pick the most striking image. Um, same with our film on Amazon. We had to, they're like, what image do you want? And it's like, people. There's so many films on Amazon Prime that we picked our strongest image, and it's worked really well for us. It turns out. Um, but you don't want just another poster of like two people looking at each other. I mean, you know, there's such generic versions of posters. You don't need to replicate that. Pick something striking, as Polk is saying. And do you feel as though that gave away for your film? Like anyone who came to see it, they're like, I already saw that from the middle of your film, that image that you used for your... Not at all. No okay. one cares. <laughs> yeah. Instead, it was something that maybe drew them. And like you were saying, it was also used in some of the um, advertising for the festivals. So that says a lot about the image. And I guess about listening to other people that are on your team too, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Collaboration is key on that. Yeah. But I understand what your hesitation yeah. with that is because, you know, you don't want to spoil it. But again, hopefully if it is playing in a, a short block, you know, by that point people have forgotten yeah. that image. Oh. You just need enough to get you into the theater and then yeah. they'll forget. And I realize for sure it's people do forget. Like they'll look at your image on in the program and by the time they get to the screening, they'll forget what they saw, yeah. right? So. And a lot of times a really good image will trick you know, our audience to thinking it's a feature film. They're like, I want to see this film. I'm like, great, not a feature, but it is playing in this shorts block. They're like, oh, okay. And then, but that was enough to, you know, swing them over that way. Well, we're, we've talked um, about some of the aspects about getting people to see your film. Um, when you think about putting it up on, on a platform, say like Vimeo or YouTube, can you talk about your thoughts about that? And also, will it, make it so you can't put it into festivals. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, um, the relationship between festivals and online platforms is definitely rapidly changing, I'd say. Um, it used to be before, if your film was up online in public, festivals will not play it. That is, you know, it's just not really sustainable practice anymore. Um, but there are definitely still some festivals that, and you should check, like, before you, you know, pay that submission fee, confirm that this festival will not accept your film if it's public online because why, you know, why go through that otherwise? Um, for us, I think there's a, probably a strong preference, you know, that we have some sort of premiere status of your film, but it's definitely not um, a deal breaker on our end. If there's a film that we really love and it's already online, we'll, we'll find a way to make it work. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure how it's been in your experience. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, picking where you premiere is can be an important decision. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for us, you know, we got into a, f a few festivals, and then we found out we got into Tribeca. And so, but Tribeca typically asks that they be the premiere of your film, the world premiere. Mm -hmm. um, and so we had to withdraw from the other festivals, but that's a good situation to be in. Mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, kind of as, as you're saying, you know, not every, the, the, film festivals aren't the final destination for a film. So I urge people to think about what your goals are for the film. Like, do you just, and what your realistic hopes are, you know, just looking at the films that you admire online, what did they do? Um, and does your film compare to those in terms of quality, in terms of, you know, um, st you know, storytelling power, et cetera, um, point of view, all of that. So some films, you know, especially if it's your first film, like my first films, I put online, you know, I just put online immediately because I didn't even, I just wanted to get some feedback. And that's a totally worthy destination. Um, and then for the next one, you might be like, you know, this, this is a little bit better. Um, or this is a little more unique, maybe I can get this out to, you know, a little more selectively or do some of the, uh, some local festivals. And then you might reach even farther out for your next film. But it's not the case that, uh, you know, the only top tier film festivals or you failed or, or bust or anything like that, right? So you have to figure out your goals. If it's just to get people to see it, just put, just put it online then. That's, that's total, it's free. 
that's that's a great uh, that's a great and worthy goal as well. And um, I think films also tend to find their own path sometimes. Um, with with ours, what happened was um, because the premise was about a girl who wants a mustache. My producing partner was like, "Oh, it could also potentially fit into LGBT festivals because it's playing with gender identity." Not that it was a major part of that film, but there was subtext. So. We're like, great, so it's a kid-themed film, and it could be an LGBT-themed film. Let's try both those angles. Um, so we submitted to a bunch of both um, and got rejected by all the LGBT festivals. And for a couple of them, I asked them why, because I knew the programmers, and uh, they said, well, it's not issue-based enough to be an LGBT film. I was like, okay, fine, that, that's your criteria. I get it. Um, but then the family-friendly children's festivals embraced it fully. Um, and you know it was being put in all kinds of uh, family uh, slots, program slots, and everything. So we realized, okay, families are embracing it. We're getting good audiences. A couple of festivals put it in the comedy slot, which was weird for me because it wasn't really designed as a comedy. Like, it's like a comedy for kids, but not really for adults. Um, so hard to find good comedies. I know, Sometimes we have to just. I just felt weird shift about it. I'm, I'm like, no one's gonna <laughs> laugh watching my film. It's not funny. But anyway, um, and we're then, desperate for okay, good yeah, comedies. We're desperate, basically. <laughs> Um, and then, because we realized the family audiences were, were really responding to it, um, so we, we premiered at um, Atlanta Film Festival last year, which was April? I can't remember. I think it was April. Um, we did several festivals through the summer. And then last fall, um, the UN declared there was a World Children's Day, um, I think in November. Um, so we're like, you know what, that's a great time to just put it online. Um, try to, you know, jump on that bandwagon because they were doing a lot of publicity around, around kids' content and everything. Um, so we did. We put it on Vimeo On Demand and Amazon Prime uh, time for that day uh, and then did, like, big email blasts and publicity around that. So that actually worked pretty well. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not online now, but... Um, and that's also now triggered some other opportunities. Like, for example, um, I tied up with an organization that does... Uh, workshops in school classrooms, and uh, so they show movies to kids and they do workshops with them. Um, and their logo happened to be a mustache, which fit really perfectly into this. So, <laughs> we did some test workshops in in uh, classrooms in in Manhattan and showed the film, did you know around themes and topics, and that re did really well too. So, you kind of find your path sometimes. You just have to embrace that and like run with it. Yeah. Um, I think the takeaway is your film should have a mustache. Like heavily feature a it's mustache. It's worked out very well for you. It's worked out really well, yeah. Um, I think when you do submit online, and I think, you know, submit uh, or, or it just should be with intention. Okay. Um, you should treat it as if this is the, this is the public release of your film, um, and you should be as strategic as possible about it. And uh, if you have concluded your festival run, and, you know, I just got an, an email from an alum earlier this week saying that, you know, his film's going to be a staff premiere coming up and if we would, you know, help promote that. And of course, like, we want to support our filmmakers and our alums so much. So, you know, absolutely so that you'll have, just reach out to everyone in your network who could potentially make this release, like, all the more public and far-reaching. Mm. I like that. It would be, like you said, being very intentional about it. So this is what I'm going to do and trying to gather your resources around that, the people that you know, the people who have been following it. And um, I, I also uh, really liked, um, Polkett, what you were saying about following sort of the way that your film wants you to go and, and continue to go with it as opposed to this is the only way is if I'm accepted into this film festival, there may be other opportunities. And Timothy, you're talking about process, which is so wonderful. Is, I, is it okay to you know only make one film? Sure. But is it also uh, what a wonderful exploration to keep encouraging yourself as you go through the process. It doesn't turn out maybe the way you want it or this Again, a particular festival doesn't pick you up, but the people that you meet and, and trusting that your voice as a filmmaker is necessary and that it's okay and, and to have as an actor too, an actor who's making films to continue to put that voice out there. And I think that some of the things that you're talking about are sort of the hidden pitfalls that 
first time filmmakers m might get into because they're like, oh, I didn't get accepted. That must mean this, that, or the other thing. I shouldn't keep going. But that's not what you're saying at all. And you have the experience to back that up to just keep going no matter what the result you get. Sorry, I just want to add one more thing. Um, when going back to preparing for festivals and an audience, um, something I do a lot now is, is uh, I guess once you put the crew together and put the film together, it's sort of just making a list, breaking it down of which sort of niches you can fit into. So not just for me, it wasn't just kids and LGBT that I tried. Um, it was also, you kind of, I mean, it, it sounds a little um, crude to do it this way, but like looking at your own ethnic background and like, you know, or the team or the crew that you have and anything. So I was like, okay, I'm an, I can fit under Asian American. That's a, that's another niche. And then, um, you know, for example, my DP happens to be a woman. So, you know, female crew and, you know, so, you, and then my lead actress obviously is a woman, so it's a female-centric film. So I, I sort of almost just made a list breaking down every single sort of niche that I could fit into. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a festival for everything. So try all of those, you know? Yeah, yeah I mean, I think the, overall this probably goes under the heading of know your strengths, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Know the strengths of your film, know your strengths as a filmmaker. What, you know, what, what is this film extraordinary at? And again, not not every film has to be you know has to be Oscar nominated, obviously. But it's like, what what is this really good at? Oh, this this is really good at exploring this issue, or this is really good at scaring people, or whatever. And then you, then and you know that from the get go, right? You have that intention, not just for applying to film film festivals, but to write and direct the film and produce the film in the first place. Well, and there are so many hats. Like when you talk about, you know, Pulkit, like uh, breaking it down as to who this might appeal to. Now, if you're talking about a big budget film, they have a whole team that's going to be working on that. And you are your whole team until you decide to bring more people into it. So your team may end up being... The, the people, your producer, your um, your friends, other friends who have also created films, and don't be afraid to reach out to them for resources, even on brainstorming, because um, looking at this, that you're the you know lone person working on it, wow, that's that's really overwhelming. But to but to keep creating teams all along the way from the beginning through d distribution, um, and. You might you might be getting to this, but we had considered you know hiring someone mm -hmm. to do PR or be a agent you know a sales agent or something, but ultimately we have not done that at least at this point, partly because don't have the money, um, but also it's like you know the goal of a short film isn't really to make money or make your money back. It's just, it's, that's once in a blue moon, right? So the goal, you know, it goes back to what are your goals for doing this in the first place? And it's probably, you know, to get yourself out there as an actor, uh, to get yourself out there as a filmmaker, um, to just explore one particular idea you had. And so the, so if your goal is to you know, you're like, we have to hire someone so we can get into the max number of festivals and maybe make our money back. It's just, it's, 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 it's you're not going to do that. Yeah. yeah. And playing off of that, I think you make a really great point. And it is like going back to being as strategic as you can and, you know, applying to festivals that you probably can attend. Because if you do get accepted into festivals and you can go, many of them have publicists on hand and press blocks and ways for you to talk about your film for free as opposed to kind of hiring yourself and um, and also it's just a great way to meet other filmmakers and other industry members like every year we'll have you know filmmakers who meet at our festival and then end up collaborating on future projects together um, I think it's so it is it's important whether that be it's a local festival or just one you know you can get yourself to uh, try to prioritize that and is there anything that you think about this part of the process and we, that you need to put into the budget? Because we've talked about film festival submissions, and that might be something that just deciding on what, where you think you might be able to put it, and if you have to raise money to make sure to set some aside. Timothy? I have, I have something, which is yeah. business cards. Oh, um, okay, great. And, um, 
And then I, 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 some people do postcards. Personally, if I find a, I can't fit a postcard into my wallet. So I would rather get a business card. And then, of course, you want to have a website where either you have a trailer or points to a fa you know, Facebook page where you have your trailer and images and write-ups and so on. Um, so, you, so that is another cost. But the, for me, the business card is key because, I mean, part of why you're doing this is to get your name out there, right? In, in various capacities. And so when you're going to festivals, uh, for me, you know, I printed like a thousand cards just right off the bat and I'm already through like 90% of them. Um, just because you just meet people and how do you keep in touch? And interestingly, that's still the way that people keep in touch. And do you also put something, uh, an image from your film oh, on yeah. the business card so that oh, yeah. they have that connection there? 100%. They so they remember they remember immediately, oh, yeah, this was that striking image just going wallet back. Wallet-sized postcards, essentially. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, a wallet-sized wallet postcard. postcard. Right. Yeah, that's a great idea. And it's also something that's not a huge expense, but yeah. something worth putting money into. And then um, I want to sort of also talk about your web presence, uh, which mm -hmm. ties into budget in a way. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, I, I work on multiple projects at the same time, so I'm always juggling projects in different stages. Um, what I've now learned is to not, that you don't have to set up a Facebook page, a Twitter account, an Instagram handle for every single film that you're doing, and a website. Um, because first of all, you won't be able to keep up with updating it constantly. Um, and then once it goes dormant, it looks even worse um, that it's sitting idle. Um, so what I do now is just, pick a platform and really dedicate to it. So whether it's a website or it's a URL that points to a Facebook page. Uh, I, I mean, my experience, Facebook page and website has been like the most effective. Um, Can you talk a little bit about why that is? Um, I think because, well, for a Facebook page, you, you can post a lot of different types of media. Um, and it just, I think most, I don't know, does Facebook have the most people online, I think? Probably. Maybe. Um, one of them. One of them. Yeah. Um, I, I just find limitations with Instagram because you can't post text. Um, and then Twitter obviously has its own limitations. So Facebook, I just find I can post any type of thing on there. Um, and Or if you have a website pointing to a Facebook page, just, or if it's just a website, keep it updated all the time. Um, Budgeting-wise, Facebook also allows uh, sponsored posts. Um, so now I put in a little bit of money into the budget um, to boost posts. And it can be as little as like 10 bucks, um, but you'll have a thousand more people see it or click on something or whatever it is. It actually does help. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, a, a trick that most people have figured out by now is like even when you create a Facebook page, you can boost the page and get thousands of likes just by putting in $10. And that works. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the other thing, what was I going to say? You're talking about websites as well? Yeah, I mean, I was going to also tie into the festival stuff. Um, travel becomes expensive mm -hmm. to festivals. Um, so yes, send to festivals that you can realistically attend. Um, I do also submit to festivals where I want to visit, like I want to travel to. Um, which I'm not. That Manchester, were you hoping for Manchester? Manchester, Manchester yeah. yes. South Korea, I wanted to go. <laughs> I wanted it to be timed exactly for the Olympics. Uh -huh. Did not work out. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's also part of, you know, I think that's part of the exciting part of sen sending out a film is like, I want to go to these places potentially. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you try to put a travel budget into your uh, production budget, it's going to become really big really fast because once you get tempted by all these locations. So I think just keep that realistic. But I mean, for sure, it's, you're not going to make any money back. So it just ends up being a personal expense after a certain point anyway. Mm -hmm. um, very few festivals, I think, cover... Uh, some kind of accommodation, very, very few for shorts. Yeah, for us, it's our competition short yeah. filmmakers, um, but we just, as a nonprofit, can't accommodate everybody. Um, but I, th I think another reason that Facebook can be a just perfectly acceptable and even the best way to promote something is it's kind of a built-in, you don't have to build your website, you don't have to host your website. And it's it, you can update it in like two seconds, right? So you can uh, you can post the video and post a few images, and boom, there you do have a website now. Um, and maybe it's not as prestigious as you know every feature film 
has their own URL and and website and it's custom designed. Um, so you don't have those options really on Facebook, but you know you don't need that either. You have a built-in free platform that can you can start within half an hour, and that's pretty good for free. And also you could direct it toward yourself as the filmmaker, that if you already have a website as an actor, that you could you know put traffic toward yeah. there and then you could have uh, multiple films there that, that you're working yeah. on. Were you going to say something? This is slightly off topic from uh, Facebook and websites and whatnot, but still kind of relating to budgets and one that I think filmmakers, especially first time filmmakers, don't usually consider. Um, should your festival be, a or uh, should your film be accepted into a festival, know what exhibition format yes. um, that festival requires, because that can also get expensive. If this festival only accepts DCPs, that should be a line item in your budget. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Um, well, I think you guys actually probably have more to say in terms of navigating that process, but, you know, I think a lot of filmmakers are like, okay, great, I'm in, here's my DVD, and we're like, oh, that's not going to work for us, sorry. <laughs> um, so just, you know, I think on Without a Box, at least, most festivals will say what their preferred exhibition format is. So if you're applying to five festivals, you know, just know which, what might be expected of you should you be accepted. Also, don't send a DVD to a festival because oh, yeah. those glitch the, the most. Yeah, we're, we're, in, we're moving into a post-DVD yeah. world, at least with festivals and whatnot. So, um, I mean, we will watch them if you send them to us, but we prefer online submissions. Yeah, so, so you know, what Megan's talking about is, is they need to, certain festivals want a DCP, which is a specific format that you need to pay a company to make. Um, you can, you know. Basically a hard drive, but like a fancy hard drive. Yeah, it's like a fancy locked hard drive. Yeah. And, um, and others will want a downloadable file, but it's like really big and you need to have your post-production supervisor supervise that the making of that and it needs to be rendered in a certain way and sometimes each fe se different festivals have different requirements for that. So just up front that was a that was a cost for us that I did not realize off the bat that we'd have to make these different formats. Now that we've had enough that we've been to so many festivals that we've made all the formats that we need and they're all uh, able to be um, I can send people a link now and they can download it but that was an initial cost that we had not factored in. And for more, most short filmmakers, you know, you are the print traffic point person, um, which is something I think a lot of people don't consider really, you know, like how is your film going to get to all of these festivals? And if you are sending a physical copy of your film, you have to, you're probably going to be the one who is navigating that and working with the print traffic team at each of these festivals being like, okay, well, you know, it's here and it needs to get to this place by this date. And it's just, and you know, um, you're gonna have to pay for shipping on one end, but not on the other, and whatnot. So it's it's something to to consider and to know that you're most likely going to be involved in that process. And that's also um, a great reason to have friends, you know, to be friends with people who have been submitting to festivals to be able to talk about navigating this um, and and just to make it a little bit easier, so it's not such a shock on each, you know, each time, oh my gosh, I'm gonna have to do this and pay for that. And um, so it, it, it pays to have conversations with people about it. And I think also if you're showing up to some festivals, especially local festivals, you might be able to talk to some of the people who have submitted films and find out what they needed to do, you know, and so you'll get some more information that way too. And uh, just piggybacking off of what Megan said about print traffic, um, in addition to being responsible for sending your film, festivals also ask you for the synopsis and the stills and like a bunch of other information. Um, so what I would advise is once your film is ready and you've, you know, getting close to the first festival, just have all that information ready. Uh, because once a festival starts accepting you and hopefully you'll get many acceptances back to back, um, you won't, sometimes you won't have time, so you'll be in a rush, right? And every festival has their own deadline for when they want all this stuff. Mm. Um, and so just have everything ready. And you know, what I do is, for example, for the synopsis, I'd have my log line, then I have like, say a three, three line synopsis and then like a paragraph synopsis. I just, I just cover every length mm -hmm. that any festival might want. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's just, you know, copy and paste when they want it. Mm -hmm. um, so just do, do that homework before even your first festival and it'll make your life so much easier moving forward. 
Um, and just just going back a little bit, um, just to go to what you said. Just going to festivals in general is a great idea because not only will you meet people who the filmmakers themselves, um, you will network with other filmmakers who are in the audience, and you'll but perhaps most important, you'll get to see the level of quality and the type of film that is being made right now. And you see, you know, okay, this festival has this, you know, this is what they're looking for. This is their, you know, quality level. And others you might see, oh, okay, this is a more casual festival and it's like more homemade films. And so it really, that you'll see the whole gamut. But the more you go to festivals, uh, the more you're just, you're doing your research and seeing what's out there and how you can differentiate yourself when you're making, writing, directing, producing, and submitting your film. I think there is a home video festival, right? <laughs> there must be. There must be. There's a festival for everything. And as far as like getting excited about your film and sticking with it all the way through, it would seem almost that like the log line and how you, desc how you describe the film to somebody else, like having your elevator pitch about it. I mean, that would seem as though that might start pretty early as far as like finding out what the hook is around your film. I, I would say even before or during the writing phase because uh, there have been projects which I was in the process of writing and I would pitch people the idea, you know, the log line, the one sentence log line, and I would see them, you know, glazing over or being like, oh, so what's for dinner, right? And so you know you're not on the right track or you're, you're, you haven't found the most interesting part, mm -hmm. the most dramatic, the most conflict-packed mm -hmm. part of your idea yet. Mm -hmm. So the more you're pitching to people, for me, uh, the the better if if you see them perk up and be like oh that, oh that's a really good idea like how do oh I, I have more questions about that mm -hmm. and if they're falling asleep and uh, talking about uh, the weather we're having well then you know you're maybe not on the right track yet mm -hmm. and, and I think sorry I think that is the trick is is making them want to ask you questions mm -hmm. whatever the log line is they have to want to ask questions afterwards mm -hmm. if they're like oh cool that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> you want that spark. You yeah, want and, do, and don't inspire. just ask the people who you know are right. going to say, that's really great, uh -huh. um, <laughs> right? You need to ask people who are your peers or even superiors or mentors who are going to say, okay, this needs some tweaking or, this, yeah, this needs some work. Well, and I mean, at first it might just also be uh, just getting other people that are in your circle excited about the fact that you're writing something. Maybe you'll include them in it, um, but just to get that fire going, and they're probably going to be people who are going to be with you throughout the entire process and then all of the other folks that you're going to meet along the way. Um, I just want to say that if you have questions in the audience, um, Melissa is going to be collecting cards and bringing them up here, so make sure you write them on the paper uh, that was provided or a piece of paper that you have um, so we can get those questions answered and we'll continue on in the meantime. Um, so as far as something like online rights, do you want to talk about that? Should you give away your online rights? Should you keep your online rights? Uh, I mean, I would say, first of all, have a, you want to have a lawyer looking over every contract that you're, you're making, whether it's, it's with a sales agent or with, you know, Amazon or Netflix or another distribution platform. Um, if you're putting it on YouTube, you're pretty much giving away your rights as far as I know. I mean, I think... I'm pretty sure that people can, I feel like I've seen this, where commercials just re-air stuff and TV shows can just re-air stuff without even notifying you. Um, don't, again, double check that. I'm not a lawyer. Um, my mom is. Um, but, um, <laughs> ask so, his mom. <laughs> ask my mom. But um, so, so you want to be, yeah, you want to be very careful about that. But again, you have to also get your idea out there. If your goal is to get the movie scene and just say, I had this incredible idea. Um, uh, what's the movie Lights Out? Did, if you've seen that short film, that was, as far as I know, I don't even know if that went to festivals. That was put on YouTube um, first, I, I think. I could be wrong about that, but um, check out the short film Lights Out. Guillermo del Toro eventually got to him because it's an amazing, like, three-minute, horrifying short film. It's an awesome idea. Um, it's clearly executed for close to no money, and it's done so well, and that was made into a feature film. So and that's, that's one possible goal you might have. That's once in a lifetime. Um, 
but so it, so their goal wasn't, you know, they weren't so worried about the rights just getting eyeballs on it. So it really depends on your goals again. Mm -hmm. Generally, I do, for a short, um, I don't think it's worth giving online rights to anyone, any other company, um, because they will take a cut. If it's a distribution company, then they will take a cut from whatever pennies your film makes online. <laughs> and then you get like a fraction of a penny. Um, so it's really not worth it, I think, for a short. Features are a completely different story. Um, and the good thing f with, for example, Amazon Prime now is uh, you can submit your own short film to Amazon Prime. Uh, you go through a lot of stuff on their website, and you put it up, and they approve it, and it goes online. Um, Vimeo On Demand does the same thing. Uh, Vimeo, you can actually set your own prices for the film for rental and purchase. Amazon, I think, has their own fixed um, yeah. pricing. Um, so if, if you're making a short film and really you're not expecting to make m that much money back, you might as well just hold on to the online rights and do it yourself. Mm -hmm. um, what that does mean is, yes, you have to promote it yourself. Mm -hmm. um, but that's something, you know, I think everyone's aware of anyway when they start making the film is like, this is mine and I have to, you know, I have to own it and I have to promote it. Um, so I don't think that really makes a difference. And I would just say, you know, again, if, you're, if your goal is to get, you know, get noticed or get your idea noticed, then there, I have no problem with giving it away. And by that, I mean putting it on YouTube or, or Vimeo, um, not instead of one of the Amazon Prime type sites, because the best way to get <laughs> eyes on something is to give it away for free. Um, and again, you're going to make the likelihood, in all likelihood, so little money from, you know, unless you have either star power in it or some amazing hook. Um, but so many of the, you know, great short films are just on YouTube and that's how they got noticed in the first place. So there's, not only is there no shame in that, that can be a really valid strategy. And then there are also more curated ways mm -hmm. you can release online as well, like short of the week, <laughs> exactly, or no budge, or even Vimeo staff picks. There are... Um, where you're again not necessarily giving your rights away, but and they're you're kind of letting them do some of the promotion for you um, by reaching out to either their different audiences or just kind of it's just a little bit more curated than just putting it up online yeah. without any other kind of angle on it. So. Yeah, for sure. Well, and there uh, obviously you know one of the things that we're seeing tonight is that there are a multitude of ways of approaching how you want your film to get out there and how you do it. Uh, what you decide is right for you. And if part of it is a learning process so that you're encouraged to make more films, um, or if it's visibility for you in your career um, or as a filmmaker, or both, um, that there are different routes, you know, to be, to be taking. Um, is there anything that we should watch out for? Like, don't do that. I, I did this and I'll never do that again. Uh, a lesson hard one. Is it too embarrassing to talk about? <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> that's okay. I think, I mean, what Megan also just said about YouTube, no offense to YouTube, um, it's, there's so much stuff on YouTube that if you just put it up and don't tell anyone about it, chances are no one's going to watch it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just a waste of effort. Mm -hmm. um, so putting it online with purpose and where you're putting it, mm -hmm. and even YouTube has channels, right? It has curated channels. So contact one of the channels and say, hey, this might fit into your thing. Do you want to put it up to your audience, to their subscribers? That makes a lot more difference than making your own YouTube channel, which has your mom as a subscriber, and then there's no, one, no one's going to watch it, right? Yeah. Um, so that, I think, would be one warning. Um, Great. Yeah, and I, I would say the biggest mistake perhaps I've made in the past is being precious about stuff and being like, no, it, it has to, it, there's only one particular outlet for it. Like, it, mm -hmm. it has to be Oscar nominated or else, or, yeah. or like it has to get into a specific festival or else. And it's like, well, no, the, if, if, you make some, if you made something on like a $100 budget, it's like, that's great. Just put, just put it out there and just get people's feedback. The, you don't have to, you know, spend all your time promoting it and then get, make sure it sells to a major studio or something like that. That's, mm -hmm. That is not the only goal by any means. So, mm -hmm. so figure out what you want. 
That's great. Well, uh, we'll start with some of the audience questions. Um, so first of all, let's see. Um, this is uh, asking to be a little more specific about something we've covered already. Can you walk us through the process of putting your short on Amazon or iTunes? So those are two different things. Okay. Um, for Amazon, like I said, Amazon now lets you just upload your film directly. There is a whole process. Uh, it's called Amazon Video Direct. Um, if you go on their website, they'll tell you to create an account, or I guess you can use your own Prime account. Um, and there's a whole step-by-step -step thing. Um, but with Amazon, they also have very specific deliverables. Like the film has to be in a specific format. It needs um, closed captioning. Yep. So it tells you all those things. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a completely sort of self-distribution sort of model. Um, iTunes and what's the other one? Um, Hulu, Netflix sometimes. Um, usually you can reach them through uh, an aggregator. Um, so these are basically middlemen companies that where you submit the film to this company and they sort of pitch it on your behalf. Mm -hmm. um, it's not always successful for shorts. Netflix rarely takes shorts. I think they have all of like two shorts online. <laughs> Um, mostly documentaries, too. It's mostly documentaries. Um, so I wouldn't even bother with Netflix with a short. Um, iTunes, maybe. Um, but again, by the time you pay the aggregator company in the middle to do this work for you, and then by the time iTunes takes it on, if they take it on, there's other costs involved, like getting it ready for iTunes, and then iTunes takes a cut, too. So like you're really not making any money, or it's not really worth it by the end of it. You're losing money. You're actually losing money. Mm -hmm. Um, and Hulu, is some, I, I don't even know if Hulu takes shorts. Um, so maybe it's not worth it at all, actually. <laughs> okay. um, so I, I, I mean, but, yeah. but I, I would also, you know, encourage you to ask yourself, have I ever paid for a short film? Yeah. Mm. And Good most question. people have not. And so it's like, why would yeah. I pay for that, for my own short film? Right. And so, again, you want to think about, you know, what, what is your platform if and when you get past the uh, festival stage? Great, thank you. Uh, Timothy, this one's for you. How did you get your film on United? Oh, so so both United and for us, Amazon Prime has a curated uh, Tribeca Shorts program. And United is a sponsor of, of Tribeca Film Festival, and they also have a deal with United. Mm -hmm. So we were asked by both platforms um, if we'd be interested in being a part of it. Um, so so that is hard to instruct others as to how that happened because we didn't even know that was a thing. Um, so we got, you know, very lucky and we were very, we were very pleased about that. There are um, very few um, airline distribution companies or in-flight distribution companies. Again, they usually prefer features and documentaries, especially award-winning films for airlines. Um, but in rare cases, they might take a short. Um, but again, that's the case to case by case basis. Okay. Thank you. Um, this is a question from Deborah. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, can it be too early to commit with a distributor? Uh, she wants to find out about pros and cons. She said, we were approached as we are raising funding for the project, for, yeah. for editing. Yes. I, can it be too early to commit with a distributor? I mean, it's, it's what we were discussing before. Yes, it can be too early because what are they... I mean, there's obviously there are some great ones that could really help get your film out there, but you're almost definitely having to pay them or they'll take a cut from anything you make to pay themselves before you get see a cent. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm not saying there, that it can't be a good strategy, but I mean, what I feel like if they're looking at your film and you haven't even made a film, then what uh, that, that strikes me as possibly suspect. Okay. Well, I, I get suspicious immediately when I, if yeah. I if I get a distributor contacting me before I even made the film, I'm like, why do you want this? Um, In, unless you happen to have major celebrities attached to it, and so they immediately see the commercial potential, but then they're gonna seek you after the film is made even more anyway. So you mm -hmm. you I would not commit at this point. Also, just do your research into anyone that approaches you. Like, do a lot of research. Um, any, you know, it's easy to call, you know, yourself a distribution company or a sales agent. Just do a lot of research into what they've done, and if anything suspect. And I think, you know, like Timothy said, if if they're coming to you for a short film before it's even been made, generally it's suspicious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Although I have to say, I think it is. We are on 
the big be- or at the beginning of seeing that trend change. Not so much with short films, more with feature films. Yeah. I think. You know, just this past Sundance, there were very few acquisitions out of that festival, which was very unusual. And a lot of these studios and distributors are going to move more towards in-house production um, and less buying out of festivals. So um, I don't know if it's going to start at the short stage so much, um, but it's, you know, at this point in time, I would agree with you guys. It's probably a little early to have that conversation. Well, and I like what you said too, Polk. It is about um, doing your research on people, making sure that, I mean, at, as far as even when you're starting with your crew, who you're going to be working with, who you're bringing into your circle, because again, you don't want your idea to die on the vine along the way because you're like, oh, this person really took me on a wrong turn, you know? I mean, you want to really have a trusted group of people that you're working with. Uh, Laura Fay is asking, how much does a DCP cost and what does it stand for? We talked about that earlier. Digital, Digital cinema package? Yeah. Is that it? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds right to me. I didn't go to film school, so. <laughs> okay. Sure, that's what it means. Uh-huh. Um, how much does it cost? So or? for shorts, um, it can vary depending on where you're getting it done. You can get it done in someone's uh, edit room, bedroom, if they have the right software, Uh, but definitely test it. Um, But it can range, if you get it done in a professional company, it can range from like 150 something to like, for features, they can go up to 1,000 easily. Um, For shorts, uh, they basically give you like a flash drive, if that's how big it is, the DCP. Um, because the shorts are much smaller in size. Um, for features, you get like a full hard drive. Um, but yeah, it, it can totally vary. Um, but so when I said earlier, so some people can, some really good editors and editing companies can make it in-house. Mm-hmm. Um, just double check to like test it right. before you send it to any festival. Definitely oh. test it. And sometimes they'll charge even in-house. That's an extra cost yeah. for you, the, the filmmaker, even if, you're, even if it's with your own editor or post-production facility. Yeah. And a lot of festivals also require a backup because this is, you know, a vulnerable technology and they, you know, you can test it as much as yeah. you want, but it will inevitably fail at one point. And so uh, make sure that you have, you know, usually the backup, they won't require necessarily like a second DCP, but, you know, make sure you send whatever format they request, whether that be a downloadable file or a Blu-ray or anything. Basically, post-production in general, color, sound, editing, uh, et, you know, et cetera, mix, sound mix, uh, music, just costs way more than you ever budgeted every time. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Um, so this is from Vance. Um, Megan, can an acceptance be rescinded, or is it no backsies? Good question. Mm. Um. You mean from the filmmaker? I'm going to assume you're meaning from the filmmaker's point of view, not from us. Um, Yes, it can be rescinded, and it has. Um, I mean, it's never something that we enjoy happening to us, but Mm -hmm. there are times, I mean, you were saying before that, you know, you had been accepted into a few festivals prior to Tribeca, and Tribeca requires the world premiere for your film, and um, you have to have those tough conversations sometimes with festivals. Uh, and we do, we do understand. We know sometimes that, you know, you know, you were very excited about our festival, and then another opportunity came along that is just honestly better for you, um, for your career, for your film, and uh, yeah. So it definitely can happen. All right. And then also, have you had experience with brand partnerships? Have any? Have and have either of you filmmakers had? experience with brand partnerships? Not exactly. We've uh-huh. definitely asked people to donate stuff mm-hmm. for free, mm-hmm. um, like restaurants or, or locations or whatever. But um, I, I know, you know, I have had clients who were able to get a brand sponsor for their short film or their web series or something, but that is definitely, you have to have something to prove why you're a valuable commodity. It's like, okay, we're going to put your, you know, your brand of watch on film. It's like, great. Now, how can you guarantee that you'll get my company uh, lots of views on that film? 
or web series. And so if you don't have any track record, that's going to be extra difficult. So I've rarely seen, I've rarely, but probably never seen that happen on the first one or several projects. But once you, you know, once you've proven yourself, then it can get a lot easier to start asking smaller local companies, you know, if they want to be featured, if they donate X amount of goods um, or a specific product to your film or car or whatever it is. I mean, yeah, the same thing. I think just being creative, what, what you mean by brand partnership, so not mm -hmm. just necessarily big companies that would pump money into it, but, you know, my, my entire film was shot in one restaurant location uh, for three days, and it happened to be a new restaurant that opened up around the corner from where I live, so I became friends with the owner, and, you know, and then the, the only condition he had to letting us film there was that we show the name of the restaurant in the film, mm. which I did very happily. It didn't bother me, so and he let us use it for three days. So, you know, those relationships are important. So think of restaurants yeah. and business owners and what they get out of it too. Yeah. Um, and then in return, I also talked to him about making like a promo video for his restaurant. So mm. you kind of do a barter thing as well. That's Great. wonderful. Yeah. It sounds like a real win for both sides with yeah. that. You got your location for three days and he got the yeah. advertisement and the promo. Well, I have to tell you something. We're out of time. So, um, I'm sorry I didn't get to all the questions. Um, please feel free to uh, ask them afterwards. Um, also, I would like to find out from each of our wonderful panelists what you're excited about that you're working on right now. Uh, sure. Uh, right now, we're in the midst of one of uh, the Hampton Film Fest off-scene programs, which is our annual Screenwriters Lab. It's our 18th year of this lab. We are, um, unfortunately, all the deadlines to submit have passed, but uh, we'll be making our selections and announcements on which three, essentially the lab, we select three projects and their writers, and we take them out to the Hamptons for a weekend, and we pair them with three industry mentors for a whole weekend of development workshopping and whatnot. And uh, so, yeah, we'll be making announcements on those projects and writers uh, in the next few weeks. So I'm very excited for that. Wow, that sounds great. Yeah. Paulkin? Um, I'm actually excited about three things. Um, so I'm uh, actually all on the producing front. So I'm a co-producer on a feature documentary called Invisible, uh, which is about people with fibromyalgia. Um, so that's in the editing stage right now, and we're hoping to push it out by, by the fall. Um, and then two shorts, which I've also produced. Uh, one's called Brunch Wars. It's a dark comedy. Um, and one's called The Brazilian Dilemma, which is a sex comedy. Um, so they're all in post and getting ready for festivals this year. Fantastic. Thank you. Timothy? Um, I, I just got uh, done writing um, comedy for the host and, and presenters at the Writers Guild Awards um, that were uh, a week and a half ago. Uh, and that was really cool. You can actually find that online. It's super funny. Um, and you see some celebrities being really raw, so that's cool. Um, and that would be on the WGN... Uh, WGAE uh, 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 website, WGA, yeah. WGA um, website, okay. Yeah, or their YouTube channel. Um, and uh, working on the feature of Lemon, so look for that in a later year. Um, <laughs> um, definitely, uh, if you uh, are interested in my uh, workshops, go to blueprintscreenwritinggroup.com. Uh, that's Blueprint Screenwriting Group, and uh, or talk to me afterward. Um, and oh, they're all they're all filled until May, actually. But um, come find me afterward. Um, and uh, you can also find me performing improv for free in the basement of a bar near Penn Station <laughs> several times a month. So come see me there. I'll let you do the legwork on that. That's all the information I will give you. Thank you. Uh, I just want to thank our wonderful panelists. Um, you've just been so full of great information. Thank you. We so appreciate thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.